Podcast. Ugh, what is this world I'm in? I can't even believe it at all. Ugh, I must have fallen into the new grounds portal and ended up in this place. Oh my god, is that the boyfriend from Friday Night Funk? child of the 2000s, not only have I seen every possible disaster in relation to both the ecosystem and the economy, I also grew up in the heyday of internet animation. <sighs> I would go on Newgrounds for hours and scroll through all the games that people would make for free. I'd spend hours playing dad game, watching Sonic shorts and parody rangers, going to school the next day and telling all my friends that there was a video online with the Power Rangers and they were having the sex word. It was a magical time, and looking back, everything holds up exactly as well as when I was a child. Just like all childhood media. And none of these precious memories would be possible without Flash. An Adobe product with tons of application. Whether it be animation, game creation, desktop apps, or website creation, Flash proved itself to be a valuable tool for any creator. The problem is that with the march of time came the need to update. And considering Adobe is the single most putrid company on this big dirtball we call Earth, they chose to discontinue and retire the Flash player causing years and years of internet history to be dusted, just like that. However, in the case of some games, they actually managed to transcend their browser game origins and move on to full-blown releases. This video can't cover all the releases, obviously, but I'll try to cover the best of the best. Starting with the earliest Flash success story, Alien Hominid. Alien Hominid started life as the creation of Tom Fulp, the creator of Newgrounds, and Dan Paladin. Released in 2002, it was a Metal Slick and Contra-inspired shooter all about blasting the FBI as a crash-landed alien. However, later on in the game's life cycle, more and more work was done to improve it, to the point that the 2002 game now acted as more of a prototype than a finished product. The game's development eventually got so big that with the help of John Bayes, Alien Hominid was on track for a console release. In Europe, the game's distribution will be handled by Zushi Games, and in America by O3 Entertainment, a company most famous for releasing Chaos Wars on the PS2, which you may know for... We need to hurry, everyone is waiting for us. Ah! Screaming! It came from the bad alley. Sounds like a girl. I'll go check it out. Oh, we'll get back to you soon, Buster Brown! Seeing as they were now developing a full console game, Tom, John, and Dan formed The Behemoth, and released Alien Hominid in 2002 on the PS2 and Xbox, 2004 on the GameCube, and 2005 on the Gizmondo. The game went on to be a critical success and opened the way for even more games from The Behemoth, including smash hits like Castle Crashers and Battle Block Theater, with their latest game Pit People releasing in 2018. They're currently hard at work on Alien Hominid Invasion, a reimagining of the original game set to release on the Switch, Xbox, and PC. Alien Hominid might not seem like it, but it's probably one of the most important games in this era of gaming, showing that games developed into more accessible game-making tools could still see mainstream success. As gaming became more of a mainstream acceptable hobby, some hallmarks had to be left by the wayside in the name of accessibility. And we had to dumb down our Vita gems for them commoners what don't know how to Mario. One thing that people felt was lost in translation was difficulty. Games were made easier and easier, with the Ninja Gaidens and Contras of the world being replaced with Goo Goo Gaga baby games like Kirby and Cooking Mama. What with their save features and more than three lives, I spit on your save features! This led some people to craving games that were hard for the sake of being hard. In steps Edmund McMillan and John McGinty, who over a three-week period in 2008 developed Meat Boy, a precise and tough-as-nails platformer that tasked you with slipping and sliding all around the stage to save your girlfriend Bandage Girl from the evil Dr. Fetus. Soon after the game's release, Nintendo and Microsoft took notice of the game's developers and propositioned them to make games for their online game stores, WiiWare and Xbox Live Arcade, respectively. After going back and forth on what game to exactly make, they decided on an expanded version of Meat Boy. Development started on Super Meat Boy with the highest of hopes, with Edmund saying this game would be so amazing that you'll crap your pants and so awesome that your body will suck the crap back up inside you. Yeah, it was 2009, all right. However, by the end of development, these high hopes would sink to the depths of despair, as shown in the documentary Indie Game The Movie. Edmund and the newly created Team Meat would go through hell to get this game made, with Xbox saying, Ah yes, Sunny Jim, we'll promote your game at our big Indie Game Showcase, if you complete four months of work in two! And seeing as the project's funds were close to this, the team had no choice. 
five hour sleep cycles and a few dozen missed meals later, and Microsoft decided that now would be the perfect time to kick the team while they were down. The game received barely any promotion for the entire showcase, despite ending up being the best selling game out of the whole lineup. Soon after the game released on all platforms, uh, except for Nintendo, since the game's file size ended up being bigger than what they agreed on, and PlayStation, since they apparently just didn't care. Needless to say, the game was a smash hit, selling well over a million copies and validating the hours and hours of pain that went into making it. Since the game's release, Edmund left Team Meat and went on to a similar flash to full release conversion in The Binding of Isaac, a game that they just won't stop making. Just release Mugenics already! And the now endless Team Meat created Super Meat Boy Forever, which was. not warmly received. From a game whose development was insanity to a game that's flat out insanity, my friend Pedro was one of the indie darlings of 2019. Mixing the shoot 'em up gameplay of games like Madness with the combo based gameplay of Tony Hawk, there aren't many games that have gameplay as frenetic and crazy as Pedro's time bending gunplay. But, would you be surprised to learn that this started life as this? Probably not seeing as it's in this video, but still. Pedro's story starts with its developer Dead Toast, or Victor Ogren as real people call him. Victor is no stranger to the Flash scene, most well known for his impressive remake of Pico School, one of the most important Flash games of all time. However, looking through his Newgrounds page shows a large gap in any content for a period of about seven years. That's because he managed to get a job at the up and coming studio Media Molecule, where he went on to work in level design for games like Little Big Planets 1 and 2, as well as the Vita game Tearaway. Clearly, the indignation of working on a Vita game got to him as Victor left the company in order to try his hand at solo game development. The first attempt was with the game Nunchuck Charlie, who can be best summarized with its own Newgrounds description. It was just another afternoon in the Nunchuck household, when suddenly Mr. Teddington, Charlie's life comrade and teddy bear, gets taken away from him. Fueled by love, sorrow, and guilt, Charlie embarks on a journey down the wishing well of forbidden dreams, battling his way through egg hatch security guard bears, flesh-eating mullets, and pigeon laser farts. Oh yeah, it was 2014, all right, I can smell the Newberry comics on this thing. However, after that failed to catch the imagination of the public, Victor tried something a little different and went on to create the very, very rough draft of what would become My Friend Pedro. Lots of mechanics in what will become the final game were present, like the bullet time, emphasis on diving to locomote, but something that was missing was the point system. That would be introduced in the game's follow-up, My Friend Pedro Arena. As 2014 died and 2015 crawled out of its festering corpse, Victor decided to take Pedro into development for a full release. This was a solo developer's effort, as well as his first time working in 3D, texturing, mapping, creating character models, all by himself. The project was worked on in an on-again, off-again style for the better part of a year until things went into full swing by the end of 2015. Soon after, the game was set to be published by Devolver Digital, developers of damn near every indie game released for the past couple years. You could throw a rock into a crowd and end up hitting one of the games they published. Then the ball really got rolling at the E3 presentation in 2018. Pedro is shown off in its final form and oh lord what a transformation! It's the equivalent of not seeing your high school friend for a couple years and they came back with a face tattoo. Pedro was unrecognizable in this form, with a sense of flash and style that set it apart from the pack. When your trailer shows that your game includes the ability to kick the severed heads of your opponent like soccer balls, you know you have a winner. Pedro would soon come out on June 20th, 2019, and was lauded for all the above reasons. Even nominated at the Game Awards of the year of its release for Best Debut Indie Title. A reminder that that title was made by one guy based on a Flash game. For this last example, I really want to hone in on how much these games influenced me personally growing up. There I was in July of 2011 on Newgrounds. I was still pretty sure I shouldn't have been on this site, but I deleted my browser history every time I left, so I was basically Solid Snake. I scroll down to see what games are trending on the homepage. Uh, Learn to Fly 2, Pokemon Tower Defense. Uh, oh, hey, the new Riddle School game. That's nice. But then you see it. Stealing the diamond. I had never heard of it before, but I decided that it would be worth a shot. What I ended up getting was such a fun experience, I instantly went back and played the previous games. I'd sneak out during lunch at middle school to play them at the computer lab. I'd play through all the games a bunch and get all the fails. I loved the series. That series was the Stickman series. Which I call it because it doesn't really have an official title. THANKS! It would go on to get two sequels in infiltrating the airship and fleeing the complex, the latter of which I actually remember refreshing the page on Newgrounds for about an hour waiting for it to come out. Eventually though, after fleeing the complex, the two year cycle that these games would come out on was slowing down to the point that there was no new Stickman games for over five years. 
Little did we know why exactly that was the case. You see, since Adobe, who, reminder, would sell your mother into slavery and force you to buy her back on a subscription model, were shutting down Flash. The man behind the Stickman series, Puffballs United, decided that there would be new avenues taken if they wanted to make the swan song for the series. This was going to be a full release and would pay off all the different routes throughout the series. But that would be a little difficult. See, the old games like fleeing the complex and infiltrating the airship were locked behind that pesky flash barrier. So Puffballs, with the backing of his newly established company Innersloth, worked on a complete remaster of the series going all the way back to Breaking the Bank, the first official entry in the series. But that wasn't all. The hook of the game was that whatever paths you took in infiltrating the airship and fleeing the complex would determine what paths you could take in the brand new final chapter, completing the mission. This was the perfect love letter to everyone who fell in love with the franchise, experiencing every possible scenario for how events could have played out, all while keeping the reference-based humor that drew so many into the series in the first place. It's bittersweet to know the series has to end, but at the very least it's going out on the highest of highs, and we don't have to hold the funeral on ArmorGames.com. But what are they working on now? Um, I think, I think Intersloth went bankrupt after the and never ever it's so weird to think about how much of the culture I grew up with is just gone forever. However, it's not all lost. So many of the animators that I watched growing up have either moved on to bigger and better things, or ended up starting cults. Hebrews, coming from our future. Thoth says that they came from off-planet, but we don't know where exactly. Not a lot of in-between. Game developers are moving on to more sophisticated tools, and while not all of them get to convert their Flash game ideas into full-blown releases, they're still applying their crafts that they learned in Flash to new projects and the culture that Flash cultivated is still thriving today. Newgrounds is still a haven for creator-driven content, with its own Flash player to preserve fragile media, and one of the biggest games in the world right now, Friday Night Funkin', wears its Flash inspirations on its sleeves, going so far as to include iconic characters like Pico, Tankman, and Hank G. Wimbledon, so while it's sad that so much of that media is going to be lost, at least it's not forgotten. Wait a minute. Friday Night Funkin'. And Among Us? I mentioned them! I can put them in the thumbnail now! I can make them just the thumbnail! I'm gonna be a million! Are you f***ing with me?! <laughs>